So yeah, let's welcome Judith Romani, uh, who's going to talk about quadrupole excitations in the multiferroic Ackermanites. I don't know how to get this Swedish pronunciation correct, but <laughs> accent, but we look forward to your talk. What do you use it then? I think it's a, I'm not 100% not sure, but I think it's an Ockermanite, like, which sounds like an O, but I'm not sure. Maybe there is some people who know it, <laughs> or like from some Scandinavian country, and they can do this. Okay. Anyway, thank you, Yasir. And uh, also thank you and your fellow organizers for inviting me to this wonderful conference. Uh, I've never been to India, so I really enjoy uh, being here. And uh, you know, at the beginning, I didn't want to come in person. I was like, oh, yeah, it's too far. I'm just going to be online. But then Yasir convinced me, and I, I'm really grateful for that. OK, so as um, Yasir was saying, I'm going to talk about quadrupolar excitations in multifaric systems. And um, I'm actually very happy that um, Andre was giving the talk before. How does it work? It doesn't work. This thing. Can I, I will just use my computer. It does? Okay. okay. So it's great that uh, I'm coming after uh, Andre Jordev because he already uh, gave a very nice uh, introduction on multifaroic systems and uh, monetary couplings. So I don't really need to go into, uh, into details, but just for completeness. Uh, I will nonetheless, uh, you know, repeat some of the things that you already heard. And um, before I really uh, begin, I have to say that I speak very fast when I'm nervous, and I'm very nervous. <laughs> so anytime you feel like you don't understand what I'm saying or I don't articulate enough, please let me know uh, if you're interested in what I'm saying. And also, I'm not very loud. So maybe this microphone helps a little bit, but if you don't hear what I'm saying or you don't understand me, please let me know. Okay. So. Um, uh, in general, you know, multiferric materials are, are interesting, as we, as we learned from Andre's talk. And uh, in, the, in these compounds, different kind of orderings can coexist. For example, um, as, um, as we learned just from the previous talk, some kind of a ferroic order or uh, sorry, a polarization can uh, exist with a monetic, uh, monetic ordering. And there are different kind of categories and different types of, uh, of these uh, multiferric systems. And what, we, what I'm going to talk about it here is, uh, is this special uh, family which have some kind of a monetary coupling. And this monetary coupling is interesting because this allows us uh, the, the control of, uh, for example, magnetic ordering with the use of electric field or the induced electric polarization with the use of magnetic field. So we, we, can, we have these two type of orders and we can control them with the conjugate field of the other. So um, usually, uh, it's very difficult to bring together, for example, some kind of finite polarization and monetic order in a system because uh, these degrees of freedom, so polarization and spin, they transform very differently on their inversion and time reversal symmetry. Right, so if you have, uh, for example, polarization, then on the inversion, this will change sign, while the spin degrees of freedom remain in the invariant. And they behave completely the opposite way under time reversal symmetry. So in fact, uh, we need to have inversion symmetry broken for, for these, uh, this kind of coupling to be allowed. So when we can actually express some kind of um, electric polarization that was induced by a spin order, and then we need here some kind of an, uh, an even uh, power for these spin operators so that this quantity actually is time reversal invariant as a polarization should be. All right, so we already have seen um, different microscopic mechanisms that can actually give us some uh, spin ordered uh, polarization in a system. So I will not go into many details here, but just let me emphasize that frustrated magnets are a really good, uh, you know, and uh, very fertile ground for achieving this because, you know, in these frustrated systems, uh, we, have, we can satisfy all of the interactions on every bond simultaneously. And then instead of, you know, sometimes having a disordered systems, the system can order. And in order to be able to do that, maybe there, uh, that some bonds are going to be actually changed and there is going to be some relaxation and, uh, you know, uh, different kind of, but that, that could actually, you know, if it happens, for example, in a uniform way over the whole lattice, then we can have an induced polarization. And one of the mechanisms is what, or, what was already mentioned by Andre is this Kostorunagos-Sobaratsky spin current mechanism that can actually happen when we break uh, the inversion symmetry on a bond between two monetic ions. And uh, for example, if you have uh, a spin spiral, or a spin helix that, uh, that actually uh, you know, is developed in a way that, uh, that the cross product of these spins is not parallel with, uh, for, uh, with this vector that connects these spins, 
and we can have a finite provision in such a system. Right. Um, another uh, mechanism that was also mentioned by Andre is this monitor restriction. When we learned from uh, uh, Kodomori and uh, Anderson that this coefficient here uh, uh, for, for this symmetric exchange, this actually depends on the, on the angle of this bond between these monetic ions. And for example, if we have a ferro ordering, then this, this angle can one, one actually be closer to the 90 degree, or if we have an anti ferro ordering, then it wants to close, be closer to the 180 degree. And that means that, you know, depending on the ordering that we have here, we can change this bond angle and also induce some kind of polarization. All right, uh, but that's not what I want to talk about here. So at least, you know, there is something left for me to, to introduce that is maybe has not been talked about by, uh, by Andre uh, in the previous talk. So this is uh, the so-called spin-dependent metal ligand hybridization. <clears throat> and in this case, uh, instead of in the previous uh, two uh, examples, let me go back here, uh, we actually needed uh, two of these transition metal ions to describe the process. So the whole, uh, you know, dispersation depended on how the spins are, uh, you know, with respect to each other, how neighboring spins are pointing with respect to each other. But in this other uh, kind of uh, mechanism, it's enough to just consider one uh, spin and uh, the neighboring uh, ligand, for example, oxygen. So uh, depending on, you know, if, if you just want to describe a kind of effective Hamiltonian for such a cluster, then uh, we would include, for example, um, a spin orbit coupling for this transition metal compound, so, sorry, transition metal ion, and also uh, some kind of a hybridization between the, the d orbitals of the transition metal and the p orbitals of this ligand. And based on, you know, what this, where the spin is pointing, we can have, you know, kind of like, uh, because of the spin orbit coupling, these, uh, these d orbitals uh, could mix, and depending on how they mix, we have a different hybridization with, the, with these p orbitals. So, you know, depending on where the spin is pointing, uh, at the end, we can have these electron clouds somehow rearranged in a way that we can have a finite polarization in the system. And I would like to point out one important thing. So here, because we just have uh, one uh, monetic ion involved in this process, uh, the, the spin operators, sorry, the second order spin operators that participate uh, in, the, in this induced polarization, they are quadrupole operators that transform as a rank two tensor. And this is because this happens on one single side. And to be able to actually achieve something like that, we need larger spins, larger quantum spins. So spin one half system will definitely not uh, have an induced polarization based on this mechanism. Okay, so this is the outline uh, of the talk. In the first part, I will uh, tell you about quadrupolar excitations in this strontium uh, cobalt germanium oxide. Um, and at uh, the, in the, in the phase when we, we have this field aligned uh, uh, spins. And for um, the sister compound, the barium cobalt germanium oxide, I will talk about the long field uh, phase and, and show that there is a non reciprocal directional dichroism in this system based on this uh, PD uh, hybridization mechanism. Okay, oh, sorry. So before I uh, actually uh, show the, the results, let me uh, you know, thank my, my collaborators, Carlo Pence, who is uh, along with me providing the theoretical interpretation for, the, for these measurements. And uh, for the barium cobalt germanium oxide, uh, I'd like to thank or acknowledge uh, Shandor Kordach and Dijan Kishmerki, uh, who were uh, you know, the main uh, 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 people who do, did this ESR uh, and also uh, measuring the polarization, the dispersation. And I need to also acknowledge Jakub Bid, who's a student of uh, Shandor's, and he did most of the measurements for directional dichroism. And for the strontium cobalt germanium oxide, this uh, has, uh, you know, the, this uh, work has been done in collaboration with uh, the Osaka group, with uh, with Ogivara Sensei, and and Agakisan, who was uh, back then still uh, uh, at Osaka now at his uh, uh, university. Okay, so <clears throat> right, so Ockermanites, maybe I should call them Marylites because the structure really is a Marylite structure, but in the literature this is more uh, used, I think, and the Ockermanite is actually this material here. But these are these have the similar uh, you know, uh, structure, and these are quasi two dimensional systems where we have the magnetic ions in a, in a, in the x y plane, and perpendicular to it, they are kind of layered uh, with these uh, um, uh, the alkaliners uh, metal ions, and uh, of course this can be many things. So there is a lot of sister compounds that uh, exhibit similar properties, but they are a little bit different uh, from each other as you will see. So we have this tetragonal uh, symmetry. 
and uh, both the static and dynamic monotheletic effects in these compounds can be accounted for using this PD hybridization mechanism. All right. There are other uh, kind of important uh, things that I would like to emphasize all the way uh, around this talk is that instead of just having, so this looks like a square lattice uh, of this, uh, the cobalt ions, which is the monotheletic ion in this system, which are these orange uh, ions here that are sitting in a tetrahedral environment. So instead of having just a, a, you know, a plain square lattice, we actually have two sub lattices because the tetrahedral environment of the two neighboring uh, cobalts is different. It's, uh, it's tilted from each other by a copper angle, and this copper angle is different for the two. Okay, uh, so what you can see here is kind of um, some static measurement for the monetization. And uh, for uh, the barium uh, cobalt germanium oxide, so it really just this uh, alkaline earth is the, the only difference between the two materials. But as you can see, uh, if you look at the monetization, there is a, there is a, um, a bigger discrepancy between, uh, you know, uh, the measurements for when we, when we have the monetic field in the, in the plane, uh, in this X, XY plane, or perpendicular to the plane of the, of the cobalt ions. So in the case of barium cobalt germanium oxide, uh, this uh, red, the red line is when the field is perpendicular to the plane. And as you can see, there is a large uh, single ion isotropy that wants to put the spins into the XY plane, right? So they, they, have, they have to kind of like fight this uh, uh, um, easy plane on isotropy to be able to align themselves with the field. And this is actually not present uh, so explicitly for the sister compound. Right. So uh, there is one of the reasons uh, for this can be that there is a trigonal distortion of this, uh, of this environment, and this is more explicit for the barium cobalt germanium oxide giving much larger uh, anisotropies in this system than, than for example, for the strontium cobalt germanium oxide. Okay, and this is going to be important because uh, due to these anisotropies, uh, this actually be kind of important for um, having this uh, directional dichrism in the barium cobalt germanium oxide and, uh, and also for being able to observe something like a pure quadrupolar excitation in the strontium cobalt germanium oxide where the, the anisotropy is, uh, is less prominent. Okay. So um, stereostatic properties, this is the induced polarization uh, measurement that you can see here. And uh, actually what happens is that uh, if we use this uh, PD hybridization mechanism, we can derive a formula for the induced polarization uh, the, and how it depends on uh, second order spin operators. And what I would like you to remember kind of is that when the spin is pointing along one of the edges of the tetrahedron, then the polarization is positive, as you can see it here. And when it's uh, pointing along the other edge of the tetrahedron, then the polarization is negative. So this is what we can see. Uh, I don't know whether it's visible in the back or not. Uh, apologies if it, if it isn't. So, um, for example, if we have the field uh, along this uh, 110 direction, which is kind of the direction that you can see here with this arrow, in low fields, the spins are canted and they, they never start to, you know, like tilt towards the, the magnetic field. And they are aligned with one of these edges of the tetrahedron. So the polarization that we have here is positive. And then, when, uh, when we have at higher, when we are at higher fields, the spins are now polar, sorry, uh, like pointing again uh, along the field, and they are now aligning themselves with the other edge of this tetrahedron. So the polarization had to have changed sign. So there was in between, um, you know, a state where this, uh, the spins were uh, somehow in between, you know, these two directions, and the polarization vanishes. And this is what you can see here as we increase the field, the magnetic field. At some point, the polarization will vanish and then it will change sign. That's the measurement that you can see. And this is exactly what happens also for the strontium uh, cobalt germanium oxide. We have a very similar uh, polarization curve induced by the spin degrees of freedom. And uh, you know, at, uh, at uh, higher magnetic fields, uh, when, when, the, when the spins are saturated, then this actually becomes uh, more or less a flat uh, line, constant line. Okay. Um, Right, so I will begin with uh, the strontium cobalt germanium oxide, and I will focus on high magnetic field part where we can observe these quadrupolar excitations. So <clears throat> the measurements uh, for this uh, material were done uh, in Faraday and Boyd geometries, and this was unpolarized uh, light. So the only, only information really that we know is whether this was Faraday or Boyd, and what it means, I will explain because I always forget them, because I'm, not, I'm a theorist and I'm not an expert. I, I don't remember which one is which one. So when I talk about it, I kind of remind myself uh, which one is uh, which configuration. So when we have a Faraday configuration, then of course, 
we have an, uh, an external static magnetic field, right, which is what you can see on this axis here. And uh, for the Faraday geometry, uh, the light that we use to excite these uh, excitations it propagates parallel to this, uh, to this uh, external field. And that means that the processing components of the magnetic and electric fields are all uh, perpendicular to this uh, external magnetic field. Right? So we can only excite in the Faraday geometry with the perpendicular components. Whereas in the void geometry, the propagation of the light is perpendicular to the external magnetic field. And that means that this H omega and E omega, so the processing components of, this, uh, of the field, uh, of the exciting field, uh, both the perpendicular and parallel uh, components with this uh, magnetic field is going to be present. So what we can do is that, you know, we can make this measurement uh, for a given uh, magnetic field, say, for example, when the field is aligned in this pink uh, uh, part, when the field is aligned uh, with the Z direction, uh, we can make the measurements both in the Faraday and the void geometry. And if we have uh, a mode that is missing from the Faraday geometry, then it has to be excited with the, with a component that is parallel to the to this external magnetic field. Just by if you think about it, like you know, it's kind of like a game of logic where one can kind of you know figure out which one is which. Right. So for example, here you can see this mode here that that uh, that goes twice as fast as the usual magnum mode. So this is going to be our quadrupolar excitation, and this mode is present in the in the void geometry, but it's missing in the Faraday geometry, which means that it had to be excited with a component uh, of this um, uh, processing field that, has, that was parallel to this uh, Z magnet, magnetic Z direction, which is the direction of the magnetic field. All right. Uh, okay, so, right, so we have uh, a cobalt sitting in a tetrahedral environment. I think Carlo mentioned this in the tutorial, so I don't need to go into details. That actually gives us a spin three half. And as I said, uh, this kind of opposite tilting of the, of the local tetrahedral environment is important for this material. And now if we you know, consider this uh, large local Hilbert space of the, of the spin three half uh, ions, then actually we can have different uh, transitions if we start from the saturated phase. So for example, if you have you know, a large magnetic field in the Z direction, which is going to be kind of the example that I will show, but one can do the whole thing for different magnetic field directions as well. And we can have a dipole transition and a quadrupole and also an octopole transition when we flip the, the, the as the uh, three half spin all the way down to the minus uh, three half. Right? And also because we have a larger spin now, we can have on site quadrupole spin operators and therefore express you know, this polarization using those, those quadrupoles. Right. So using the symmetries, we can derive the different components of this Px, Py, and Pz. And also the, the Hamiltonian that is allowed, you know, to, that will be a good Hamiltonian to describe this material. So I have to emphasize that these are not, the, not all of the terms that are allowed by the symmetry. There are also Joachim Schimori interactions and so on, but those are not very important to discuss or to describe what goes on in the system. So we just took the, the, the minimal Hamiltonian that actually can give a good description of what's going on here. So we have some kind of an, an X, X, Z anisotropy. This lambda is the, the easy plane anisotropy and also g tensor and isotropy in the system. Okay, so if we just uh, you know, consider the spin three half as a classical spin, we can do uh, spin wave analysis and compute the, the spin wave spectrum, which is what you can see with the gray lines. Uh, here then we can only observe these uh, magnetic transitions, so the kind of like the magnon excitations. But yes, oh, I thought you were raising your hand, <laughs> sorry. Okay, but uh, to be able to actually account for the, these, uh, these other uh, high and higher energy modes, one needs to do a little bit better. And what we can do is actually you know, to treat this uh, spin three half as a quantum mechanical object and use um, flavor wave theory or multiple uh, spin wave theory that actually treats you know, the different kind of uh, dipolar, quadrupolar, and octopolar transitions on an equal footing. And then we can describe the whole spectrum uh, as at a single goal. Okay, So these are the parameters that we find that will fit the spectrum very well. And uh, as I said, I will just use one example. The example when the field is in the, in the Z direction because that's the simplest one. It becomes a little bit more complicated as we go along the way, but I, the, practically the, you know, the game is the same. So we have, we're in the fully saturated state and then we can have a one magnon uh, dipolar transition. And this is a very therapeutic. Uh, one can actually get analytically close <laughs> for, uh, for what, the, what, these, uh, what these lines look like. You know, as a function of magnetic field and uh, the, the easy plane on isotropy and, uh, and, and the J. 
it, and then we can have uh, two monon quadrupolar transitions when we when we go from the the, the three half to the minus one half state, and also uh, three monon octopolar state. And these are the, the lines that you can see here uh, in this uh, saturated uh, piece of the, the spectrum. All right. So okay, if we just we are not just interested in the energy, but also the selection rules for these uh, for these lines and whether these, they are visible or not. Then uh, we should ask ourselves. So I, mean, I can create this monon uh, with this s minus the lowering the spin lowering operator, and which which operators uh, you know contain this s minus. Right, so these are not really present in the s x and s y, and also in the p x and the p y uh, operators, right? Because p x and p y have the form something like s z times the s x or s z times the s y, and s z of course doesn't change the spin, right? And all of these. Are perpendicular to the magnetic field, which is now in the z direction, as I said, and that means that this is going to be, you know, this magnon uh, line, because of because these are perpendicular components, they're going to be present in both the void and the Faraday geometries, and this is exactly what we see in the experiment. You know, there are there are points here for both the, the Faraday and the void geometry. Now, if we go to the uh, quadrupolar excitation, then I need to apply this lowering operator two times, and the question, so like which you know which operators that I have that can uh, you know give me finite transition matrix elements will contain this s minus s minus operator. Then only the PZ operator is uh, uh, there that actually can uh, provide that transition. And in the PZ operator, you know we have this s y square and s x square, and also the x and uh, y, so x times the s y uh, components, which contain this s minus s minus operator. And that means that uh, you know this transition will actually be uh, you know, created by this uh, PZ uh, operator, and the PZ is actually parallel, right, to the to the magnetic field that is applied in the z direction, which means that it's going to be present only in the void geometry, and this is exactly what we see in the in the experiment. If I look at the void geometry, I have clearly this quadrupolar mode here, and it's missing from the Faraday geometry. So the this kind of you know simple argument for whether I can have these excitations or not. Is, uh, is working and then we can do the whole game you know for all of the different geometries and all of the different setups uh, in the experiment and figure out you know like whether i can see these uh you know dipolar modes or quadrupolar modes in the theory as well and i don't want to go into too much detail here but uh it's actually in an excellent agreement with the theoretical predictions whether we can uh, see these modes or not except uh, that there is by theory, predicted another quadrupolar mode, this Q0 mode, which is not never observed in the experiment. And that's why I put this in uh, parentheses in this table here. So this mode should be there, but it's not visible. And I would like to tell you why it's not visible from the experiment. Right, so we can have uh, like the one monon dispersion, but naturally I make this, you know, flip and then these monons can propagate over the lattice and we can compute what the dispersion looks like in this extended brilliant uh, zone scheme. And then we have the D0 um, magnon that corresponds to the 0, 0 point in the Brunner zone and the D1 that corresponds to the pi pi point. But then we can observe with the ESR, both of them because of this, because the, the, we have these two, like the A and B sublattis have different environments. So the crystallographic unit cell is the same as the magnetic one, right? The antiferromagnetic order. But we have, like, when I actually fold this, these zones back, then this pi pi point is actually going to be my gamma point. So this is actually measured in the ESR. Okay, uh, now I can have these two magnon excitations. As long as these two magnons are created very far from each other, then they can just uh, you know flow around without any problem uh, and create the two magnon continuum. And if you plot this two magnon continuum, we see that this two magnon continuum is really really broad at the gamma point, right? And it's it narrows to a single point at the pi pi point, right? And then you know uh, what happens is that when they come, you know these two magnons come really close to each other, then they can form bounded states. And uh, in fact, because we have this larger spin, they can hop on top of each other. And when that happens, then we have this quadrupolar excitation, and we can have, you know, we can compute what uh, the dispersion uh, for that would look like. And what we see is that this quadrupolar mode actually uh, will be, you know, deep inside this two continuum and decay. And that's why it's not possible to see the, the quadrupolar mode at the, at the gamma point. So this Q0 mode is not observable by the experiment because of that. Uh, but the, 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 the Q1 uh, mode, which is, you know, the quadrupolar excitation at this pi pi point is actually, you know, outside of this continuum and that's very much observable. All right, but there's still a question like, how can we see this excitation? 
why can we uh, you know uh, see this in the in the experiment and uh, the explanation for that I will again just concentrate on the on the case when the field is in the z direction so I only need to look at this pz operator <laughs> right so we have you know this this first uh, t term in this uh, pz expression is the same for the a and b sub -attices. but the second term that you can see here it has a minus sign difference for the a and b sub -lattice. depending on which sub -lattice we are it's either plus or minus which means that uh, when I actually uh, compute the polarization the gamma point so that I take the uniform combination of the A and B so that is then the first term will survive for the staggered polarization when I take uh, PZA minus PZB which is the pi pi point then only the second term will survive if the copper angle which is the, the, the tilt of the tetrahedral environment would be zero then I would not have this second term at all and there would be no Q1 uh, excitation whatsoever and the, because at the gamma point you know this uh, uh, two magnon excitation this quadrupole excitation is uh, dissolved in the two magnon continuum I would not be able to observe quadrupolar excitation whatsoever so many things have to come together for us to be able to see this uh, quadrupolar excitation and one is that we have a large spin uh, to actually have you know these uh, kind of uh, quadrupolar operator coupling to the polarization and also that we have this copper angle that is finite in this system and therefore we can have a staggered polarization and measure you know this quadrupolar excitation at the gamma point all right, uh, so <clears throat> the theory gives us uh, three monon uh, octopolar transitions as well, which are not seen in this experiment. But uh, nonetheless, there is a measurement for a, a, another sister compound, the strontium cobalt silicon oxide. So before we had germanium, here now we have silicon. And this is unpublished data, but I will just uh, very quickly flash it. So when we measure a bit magnetic field along the 110 direction, which is in the plane, then we can also, you know, compute in this uh, field line phase what these what these uh, different uh, energies would look like as a function of field. And this is the, the measurement of uh, Akakasan. You can see these. Uh, I don't know how much it's visible in the back, but there are these uh, green triangles that uh, that are uh, corresponding to the octopolar transition. It's maybe more visible here, and uh, this is clearly observed in the uh, in the SR spectrum as well. All right, so that's unpublished. We're still working on theoretical interpretation of that data and and with that I think I don't know how much time I have yes here how much time do I have not much right a couple of minutes oh my god okay <laughs> okay sorry so I will be a bit faster on the on the sister compound so the, with the, when we have the barium uh, cobalt germanium oxide because of the barium so this is lower in the periodic table and they are larger this trigonal distortion of the of the tetrahedral environment is bigger and therefore the anisotropy is going to be bigger and now i'm talking about the part the phase this antiferromagnetic phase not the saturated phase so we are below the saturating uh, magnetic field right and that means that we have the spins in the in the plane and we have a candid antiferromagnetic ground state right and we can describe it with this wave function which is not very important it looks very ugly anyway uh, but what i would like to show is that we have his, this eta parameter here and because this is a quantum spin and what we do from rotating the, the spin from you know this uh, field light phase is really an SU4 rotation therefore not the spins are not like flu, fully grown when they are in the plane when they are uh, making this antiferromagnetic phase but they're a little bit shorter and therefore we can have you know uh, not just uh, transverse fluctuations for the spins but also longitudinal fluctuations of the spins so-called Higgs mode and these are this is old uh, result um, for the ESR spectrum in different directions for this material and as you can see the multibosom theory describes it very well and what I wanted to show but I will not have time for is that in the same material when the field is in the in this uh, 001 direction then we can observe uh, a non uh, reciprocal directional dichroism which means that depending on the direction uh, that the light is propagating you know in one way or the opposite way the, the material will become either absorbent or transparent so the the size you know of this uh, uh, absorption will actually very much depend on it and i will be very quick on this so, sorry okay so the the main takeaway message which i would like you to kind of remember is that uh, when the field is in this um, in this um, z direction we have uh, we kind of reduce the space group and uh, because of that you know we can have four different kind of domains which you can see here uh, in the system and these four domains kind of 
you know, cancel each other. So we have zero uh, polarization, but it's very easy to just, you know, with applied magnetic field or applied electric field, select between the different domains and actually have an induced polarization and uh, also polarization in the system. And this is what we do. So one can actually use, you know, different kind of, um, I will not go into details for this one, but in any case, what I want to kind of remember is that here is this absorption coefficient. Uh, and that is, uh, you know, we have this plus or minus sign for the monotheletic uh, susceptibility. And depending on which domain you are, uh, you will have plus or uh, minus sign for this monotheletic susceptibility, which means that, you know, you can tune whether you have large absorption and there's a plus sign and it actually adds up, or when it has a minus sign, this will reduce, uh, you know, your absorption and then it's the, the, the system will become uh, transparent. Okay, so we can measure or even and also compute the difference between these uh, these two cases and that's actually uh, not, not nothing else but this monotheletic susceptibility. Right, and okay, so that's uh, how we can, you know, switch between absorbing and transparent directions and also, you know, one knows kind of naturally that if we have time reverse monotheletic states, they would have opposite monotheletic susceptibility. So we can very naturally switch between these different cases using monotheletic field. And the question is whether can, we can do the same thing using a time reversal invariant electric field. And the answer is yes. So that's why kind of this is interesting. We can use uh, electric field to, you know, uh, unbalance the different domains and actually switch between uh, the, these different kind of cases and, uh, and observe this uh, uh, dichroism. And this is the theory which matches very well the experiment. And with that, I will, I will, I will stop. I'm sorry for being too long and very fast. And, 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 uh, yeah. you know, perfectly on time. Thank you very much for this nice talk. And, uh, uh, we can now have some questions, Andrea. Yeah. Oh. Very nice for this presentation. So my, I have actually a question in common. The question is, uh, these quadrupolar excitations, you should be able to see them with Raman scattering, right? I think Has so. Raman scattering been done? Has it, does it see them? It would be a very easy experiment because the temperatures are reason, reasonable and uh, Raman will see. I don't know if it has been done or not. I'm sorry. Maybe Carlo knows. I don't know. Do you know Carlo? Maybe it's something to do because their Raman actually couples to the quadrupolar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the comment is that uh, you showed the magnetic structure of parent germinate, cobalt germinate. I just want to say that it was measured back in 2000 by Ben Shirani in the Belgium. I know that. Uh, and also that there is neutron spectrum by you on this one. I'm sorry for not showing it. Uh, I'm, I, only, I only didn't show because um, this, um, you know, directional electroism, it actually appears for longitudinal uh, fluctuations. And I think in the neutron, you measure only the lower modes and not the higher ones. Is it actually doable to measure that, those, those higher energy modes? They are at like one terahertz. It's, it's possible to measure with neutrons, right? One terahertz. Yeah. So I don't know, like it has never, it has not been reported before, so I don't know. More questions, Harold? Yeah. Um, thank you very much for this talk. Now, in your theory, um, which fitted very nicely um, with the experiment most of the time, you always um, say proportional. I would be curious uh, what material parameters you um, put in for get, um, getting your agreement, or, and whether um, based on your theory plus um, the experiment, you can actually learn um, the parameters of the material. Yeah. That's a very good question, and I don't have the, the good slide for it. Um, so, the parameters, for example, uh, for for this compound that I go back for the the strontium cobalt germanium oxide, because we have this analytical expression from the theory in the field aligned phase for the for the excitations, these four ones, right? Uh, we have enough uh, equations, so to speak, for the three configurations that we can actually um, uniquely specify like what would be the J's, the values of the J and the G tensor and isotropy for, for this compound to actually fit the data. And I, I think I have it somewhere. Um, the values, I don't know if you're interested. So these are the values for the, for the material. And it's, it's very nice. So we don't have to like, we don't have much room, you know, to, to play around just by, if you wanted to fit 
you know, or three monetic field directions in all cases and so on, for all of the modes. And from the sizes of the gaps that you can hear, have here at zero field and so on, and the slope. Okay, very nice. Thank you. Thanks. More questions from the participants here? Any questions from the online participants? You can unmute yourself and ask. Okay, if that doesn't seem to be the case, then let's thank you.